Let's sing it out as loud as we can. Happy Fourth of July, everybody. We're honored to live in this country, for sure. Joyful, joyful. Joyful, joyful. We are so glad that you are joining us this 4th of July. We are glad that you are worshiping with us, those of you here, those of you who are joining us online. Those of you who are here, if you look toward the end of your pews, you'll see some binders there. We would love for you to register your attendance. If you're new with us, we want to contact you. We want to let you know what is happening here in the life and ministry of our church, so we make sure 
um, to do that by you giving us your contact information. Um, the people in the office love it when you write very neatly so they can read your handwriting, um, so we appreciate that. If you don't have a binder for some reason, look to the pew before you or behind you, and we might have missed a row this morning as we've opened up our pews today. It's exciting to see everybody. Lots of things that are happening. Um, if you have a child that is in third through fifth grade, we have our LOL, that stands for Live Out Loud, week that's coming up, Jennifer, Ms. Jennifer has a lot of exciting activities for that age group, ending with a camp. Um, you can go to camp and not go to the rest of the week. You can go to the rest of the week and not go to camp. Um, she's hoping to get lots of third through fifth graders here each evening. Also, our youth week will be the same week that's starting next Sunday evening, um, and we are excited about activities. We'll be doing some mission activities and fun activities in the evening, so information here. Also on our website, watch your email for that. Lots of other things coming up. We always want you to take a look at this and see where you can get connected or what you can be involved in or in prayer for. I think that's all my announcements today. So we'll stand today and um, affirm our faith together. We use the affirmation of faith as our Apostles' Creed, and I ask that you join me as we say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together. We know this as well. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray, for pearl majesty above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown my good with brotherhood from sea
seated. As I shared before in other services, this is one of the greatest things we get to do in pastoral ministry uh, is the baptism. And uh, we are going to do that in these moments here. So we want to invite um, families to come forward, Howard family, Lover family. We're going to be following the bulletin I hope you received as you came in today. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Hear now the scripture from 1 Samuel. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. Now I give this child to the Lord. The whole life of this child will be given over to the Lord. What name shall these children be called? Beloved, do you in presenting Sutton for holy baptism. Confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you in presenting Laney for holy baptism, confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'll ask you together now. Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before Sutton and Laney, a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care, that they be brought up in the Christian faith, that they be taught the Holy Scriptures, that they learn to give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God. Will you endeavor to keep Sutton and Laney under the ministry and guidance of the church until they, by the power of God, shall accept for themselves the gift of salvation and be confirmed as full and responsible members of Christ's holy church? Let's go to this. What full name is this child given? Sutton Scott Loger, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What full name is this child be called? Laney, Olivia, Howard, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Can walk around a little bit. This is your child, oh Father, the one that you made so perfectly. This is the one whose hairs you number, the one that you called forth lovingly. Here we can see your plan and we smile for this life. But as we know this world here, our prayer for this child. May these little feet not wander from you. May these little hands be raised in worship. May this little heart be hungry for you. May this gift of life be given back to you. This is 
as a child or father The one that you made so perfectly This is the one whose hairs you number The one that you called forth lovingly Here we can see your plan in me Smile for this life But as we know this world here on prayer for this child, may these little feet not wander from you. May these little hands be raised in worship. May this little heart be hungry for you. May this gift of life be given back to you. May our lives surround this child with Jesus. May we always stand beside this family. May our actions point the way to heaven. May our gift of life be given back to you. Beloved of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care Sutton Scott Lober and Lainey Olivia Howard, whom we this day recognize as members of the family of God. I invite you now to say with me, with God's as help, we will so order, order our, our lives after, after the example of Christ that Sutton Scott Lober and Lainey Olivia, Olivia Howard surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Would you pray with me? Oh God, our Heavenly Father, grant that Sutton and Laney, as they grow in years, may also grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that by the restraining and renewing influence of the Holy Spirit, they may ever be true children of yours serving you faithfully all of their days. And so guide and uphold the family of Sutton and Laney, that by loving care and wise counsel and holy example, they may lead them into that life of faith whose strength is righteousness and whose fruit is everlasting joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thanks be to God. Yes, and Lord. The ushers are going to come, and I'm going to combine the pastoral prayer and the offertory prayer today. But before we pray, I just want to mention to you, um, Beth didn't mention this earlier, uh, of course, but there's a reception following the service today in the fellowship hall for Beth Allen, who has served faithfully here for the past 12 years. And we give thanks to God. She was serving prior to that as well, but there will be a reception in her honor she is going to be leaving from our staff, but will be remaining with our church family. Thanks be to God for that. And uh, Ethan, who is preaching today, we'll say more about that in a moment, but he also has basically grown up in this church as well, and Beth has had a tremendous influence in his life through the puppet ministry which, where he served uh, while he was here as well. But more on that in a moment. Uh, but let us go to God in these moments and uh, pray together as the people of God and ask God's blessing over this offering. Father, thank you today as we celebrate our freedom, our liberties, that we can come together freely to worship you. Thank you, Lord, even more for the freedom you give through your spirit, the release from our sins and our burdens, that your grace abounds in our lives greater than our sins. Thank you, Lord, for the legacy of faith that we have seen here today through these families and the baptism of Sutton and Laney. Thank you, God, for the legacy of faith that we see through Ethan's life, through his family. 
Thank you, God, for the legacy of faith that we have through your church and the saints that have gone before us. And as we share later in Holy Communion, that we commune with those who've gone before us and most especially with you, our Lord and Savior Jesus. God, we pray you would bless every part of this service today. Thank you that you already have. And I pray your blessing upon, God, the, the gifts that are given today. Lord, use them, multiply them. May many lives be touched for your kingdom through what is given today, we pray, in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. For I spoke a word you were singing over me You have been so, so good to me For I took a breath you breathed your life Shut up.
Ethan comes to read the scripture and preach today, I wanted to just say a brief word concerning him. When I first came to Spanish Ford, Ethan was in the sixth grade. One of us has aged quite a bit. <laughs> Ethan graduated Daphne High School, went on to complete a degree at University of Alabama, and then just completed seminary at Sanford Beeson School of Theology. He's engaged to be married uh, this summer in August, and he is now pursuing God's further call in his life and ministry in North Alabama. But it's so great to have him, and I talked about a legacy of faith, so glad his parents could be here today as well, Mark and Karen, and other members of family also. We're all very proud of Ethan. And a lot of spiritual formation has taken place in his life. And thank you, church, for being a part of that. And as we talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it just dawned on me as I was sitting there beside of him, of someone who manifests and radiates the fruit of the Spirit, Ethan McVeigh. Ethan, thank you for coming today. I'm proud of you. We love you. Pray God's best for you in future steps in ministry. Good morning. Uh, it's so good to be here with all of you. It's just a blessing and an honor, honestly, to be here and to worship with you once again, uh, even more so now. Um, and thank you, Bill, for asking me to speak and giving me this opportunity. If you don't mind, go ahead and take your Bibles, and uh, we'll turn to Galatians chapter 5. That's on page uh, 168, if you have a few Bible with you this morning. As you're turning there, I'll give you a little bit of the context of Galatians. Uh, Galatians is a letter written by Paul to a church that he planted, that he cares about and loves deeply. But this church is struggling. Actually, they're in danger. They have fallen into sin, and they've actually stepped away from the gospel. They have begun to believe differently. And so Paul is writing with two main concerns. First, he's writing to chastise them and tell them that what they're doing is wrong. He's being honest with them. But then also, and primarily, he's writing to them to encourage them. To encourage them back to a life of faithfulness and a life of faith. And that's what we read here in Galatians 5 this morning. So if you don't mind standing for the reading of the word, we'll read Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So this morning we're starting a new series about uh, summer fruit, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and, and so this text is our first and our primary text for the whole series. And this morning we'll spend our time mostly talking about the fruit of love. What does that mean for the Christian's life? And where does this fruit come from? As I was preparing this sermon after Bill had told me about this text, I couldn't help but think of fruit and gardens and vegetables. It was only uh, about a year and a half ago that my parents called me and I went over to their yard and we together dug up a small rectangle of land and put a planter box there. 
since then, we have successfully grown a few grape tomatoes. We have unsuccessfully grown a few really fat cucumbers. Not long, but fat. They were funny. Um, but it's exciting to me. Maybe it, gardens are exciting just because they grow. Each time I go over to visit, we'll spend some time talking, catching up, but then inevitably, I'll wander out the door and start to look at the garden and see which vines have flowers, which ones have fruit, and which ones are doing well, or if there's weeds, maybe. And I think this morning, the Lord is saying that each of us are like a garden. We naturally grow something, whether it's our tomatoes or it's weeds. We're naturally producing something. We're not just growing vines and growing up and aging, but also we're producing in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to ask if we might look much like a garden. And so our main point really is that God has given us the Spirit, and the Spirit is going to transform our love. God gives us the Spirit, and the Spirit transforms our love. But before we talk too much about love, let's talk about who, first, who's the Spirit, and what is this fruit that he's making? I think for that we need a little bit of Old Testament background. So in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon a believer, normally maybe a prophet or a leader, and the Spirit would come upon them and enable them to prophesy or act in a miraculous way. And so the Spirit was present with his people, and, and he would help them in times of need. But then after that happened, the Spirit would depart. He would leave. But then, next time the nation or this person was in need, the Spirit would come again. This would happen all over again. But then again, he would leave. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 36, he prophesies of a day that's coming where this won't have to happen anymore. Where the Spirit will come into a believer's life, but he won't have to leave afterwards. In verse 27, he says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel is looking forward to a time where the spirit will come into a believer's life and not just affect them for a moment so that they can do something miraculous, but the spirit will come into a person's life and remain there so that the spirit will affect the entire life of that person. So for us as believers, now we are living after Pentecost. The Spirit has come, and each day for us is a miracle day. The Spirit is living and working and acting in us. And so that's what it means for the Spirit to be within us. And the fruit, then, of the Spirit is what He is producing. It is the miracles of changing our character and making us to look more and more like Christ every day. And so we're going to, throughout this series, discuss how the Spirit does that. What exactly that looks like for us, for you, and for me, where we are. Where is the Spirit miraculously changing us? And this morning, we'll spend the rest of our time talking about how the Spirit transforms our love. And so if we're keeping up with our garden analogy, then the Lord is our gardener. And he has planted the Spirit within us. And the Spirit is growing up like a tomato plant, maybe. And he is producing these fruit. And we're going to zoom in now and talk about one fruit. Love. Love is a tricky thing to define, actually. If you look it up on Google, it doesn't give you very good definitions. Actually, the best definition you'll find is one that talks not just about emotions, but it says it's affection for another person or another thing. And that's decent, right? That's definitely part of love, is our affections, our emotions for something. But if that's all it is, then we can love a spouse, we can love a friend as much as we love a hamburger or a dog. And that's problematic. <laughs> 
And so love truly is emotion, but it's more than that. So uh, this morning, I think we'll discover how God in the Bible, his love is relationship centric. What I mean is love is all about relationships. It's centered on them. And so love, I think, is better defined as both emotions and actions that are about relationships. So there are either emotions or actions that start relationships, that keep relationships going, or just benefit relationships. And so let's look at how God has loved us in the Bible. And that's a good indicator of how the Spirit is transforming us to live in our own lives. So God has loved us in many ways, but this morning we'll look at how he's loved us sacrificially and honestly. And those are both important characteristics of love. God's love is sacrificial. This begins even in the garden. When Adam and Eve first sin, how does God respond? But he, he clothes them, not with leaves and fig leaves like they had attempted to, but with animal skins. There was a sacrifice in the garden. He clothed them. But then Jesus, of course, is the perfect picture of sacrificial love, both in his incarnation and in his death. So Jesus, God himself, who created all things and needs nothing, became a human, became someone who did have needs, who as a baby needed to be burped, and who even as a man needed to eat and needed shelter from storms. He did all of this sacrificially, right? It's for a relationship. God became incarnate so he could communicate with us in a way that we would understand his love. He was trying to begin relationships with us. He was trying to, to preserve relationship with us. And then in Christ's death, he got on the cross, of course, and took a death that he did not deserve, but one that we did. In a way that was truly sacrificial and truly for the good of our relationship, he destroyed the one thing that was keeping us from God, our own sin. God's love is sacrificial. And our love can be sacrificial. The Spirit is living in our lives and producing a sacrificial love. But what would this look like for you or for me? Well, I think maybe your first step, a baby step, is that we should be good listeners. We should be really good listeners. We should not butt in, and we should not argue, but we should be excellent listeners as Christians. Why is this sacrificial? Because for a moment we are putting our own perspective aside and simply listening and accepting of the other. That is something that is relationship centered. It's about the relationship. But honestly, besides that, sacrificial love often looks like the other fruits of the Spirit. And so keep love in mind as you continue to go through this series. Love is kind. It sees another's strengths and it encourages them. Love is gentle. In a time of conflict or a time of anger, it slows down and it's able to speak with peace and with kindness. There's gentleness with sacrificial love. And of course, sacrificial love is patient. It waits. And so we too should be living a life that is loving and kind and sacrificial in this way. And so we should examine our relationships, examine the way we relate to other people to see if we too are being sacrificial or maybe if this is a fruit of the Spirit that we are quenching in our garden, that we are not watering well. God's love is not only sacrificial, but it is also honest. A loving relationship is one that seeks to preserve that relationship. And so it will point out things that are harmful to that relationship. 
What I mean is that when there's any action or attitude which are harming or threatening to end the relationship, a loving and honest relationship will point those things out and address them, whether those are internal threats or external stresses. And God does this with us from the very beginning. Again, if we go to the Old Testament this time, if you look at the book of Deuteronomy, God gives us his law. He tells us lovingly, actually, his law. This is not a hard or harsh lifestyle that we must abide by. Instead, God is kindly saying, if you desire to be in relationship with me, this is how to best do it. This is how we can keep this going. This is how we can live together for all eternity. And then when his people sin and step away from that lifestyle, that relationship with him, God is honest enough to point it out. So first, he's honest to tell us what a good relationship looks like. But second, he's honest to confront us in the midst of conflict. We call this conviction. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 12, after David has sinned against Bathsheba and he has had Uriah killed in battle, the prophet Nathan comes to David because he has yet to confess his sin. And Nathan confronts King David and says, David, you are the man who has sinned against God. And David then, he confesses. He asks forgiveness of the Lord. So God's love is sacrificial and it is honest. We see it finally in Jesus' own teaching. Jesus is, Jesus is honest. He's quick to talk about sin and death. And the Pharisees don't like him much for doing this. But there are many people who are not scared to admit that they are sinners. And those people in the society are the ones who flock to him, knowing that they need someone who will be honest about their lives. So that they can get past this and have a real relationship with God himself. And so we too in our lives should have an honest love. Matthew 18 talks about how if someone has offended you or sinned against you, that you should go to them and you should tell them that. And you should seek together to be reconciled. So church, we should not avoid conflict. We shouldn't withdraw or run from it. But in Galatians 6.1, which is a verse that comes right after our passage today reads, Brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him, how? In a spirit of gentleness. We should have a gentle honesty. This is true love. It is both sacrificial and honest together at the same time. Truly, it's the love of God. And so we should confront others when they have sinned against us or even when they are in sin, knowing that we can help them preserve their relationship with the Lord by confronting their sin, that it's actually a good thing for them. And so this morning, I'd like to ask, how is your garden doing? Not your tomato plant, but how's the garden of yourself, your soul? What's growing there? Is it love? Is it sacrificial love, honest love? Is it God's love? Or is there pride and other weeds that are beginning to pop up? I think we should all be people who examine our relationships. And I think the best way to do this isn't to just sit alone and think about them. But instead, the way to examine a relationship is with the person that you're in a relationship with. And so this is what I commend to you, maybe even challenge you to do this morning. Pick maybe two or three people in your life who you are close with. Go to them and say, 
I would really like to know how you think we're doing. How's our relationship? And I promise to pray about whatever you say for at least two days before responding. We should be people who listen well. We should consider their perspective, pray about it, take it seriously, and seek either to be reconciled over the hurts that we're facing, or we should celebrate that the relationship is thriving. Ask not only how is your garden doing, but who is gardening you? Are you allowing the Lord to put the Spirit in your life? Are you open to the ways that he is speaking to you? We've already participated in baptism together. We will participate in communion as well. And we have read the word. These are all ways that God speaks to us and puts the spirit within our lives. He convicts us and loves us into relationship with him. So are you trusting God to garden you also? Are you trusting your church to garden you? Are there others? Do you have friends that you would trust to come and pull the weeds out of your own soul garden? Or are there friends that you would trust to share the fruit of your soul garden with? All of your love and your kindness. So, There is hope for your garden this morning. If you are feeling worried or scared about the amount of weeds or the life of your fruit, know that there is hope for your garden this morning. And that is because God himself is the one who plants the Spirit within you. And it is the Spirit himself who will grow a lifestyle of love within you. Christ died, in fact, in order that the Spirit might come and be constantly present with his church so that we can live a miraculous life of love every day. The Spirit transforms the way we relate to one another, and it allows us to have a lasting relationship with both God and others by being sacrificial and honest. And all of this glorifies God by revealing his love to the world. This morning, we've talked much about God's presence with us. I think there's no better way for us to act and celebrate this than to go into communion. And so I hope that as you come to the table this morning, you're reminded that you are in the presence of God, not just as you eat the bread and take of the wine, but also every day because the Spirit is present with you and in you, and he is actively transforming your love. Pray with me now as we prepare our hearts for communion. God, thank you for being here with us now. God, we ask that you would garden us, that you would grow us, We ask that you would show us the ways that we can produce and preserve our relationship with you and with those around us. Help us to be loving and kind, and we ask that your spirit would be active in each of our lives. We pray for your protection and your presence all of our days. Amen. I invite you now to join along. You can turn in your hymnal to page 12 or follow along on the screen with the liturgy of the word. I want to remind you that in the United Methodist Church that we practice open communion. If you know Christ or desire to know Christ, you are welcome here. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, 
we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to pray in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. May we continue at the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Hope you received a cup as you came in. And many of you have, we've done this before, for those of you that may be new, on t the very top layer of this cup is a little piece of plastic cellophane. If you'll peel that back to get to the wafer. And let us take and eat in remembrance of the body of Christ given for us. And you'll peel back the foil from the cup. Did you have one? Thank you. And let us drink in remembrance of the blood of Jesus shed for us. Thanks be to God. As Ethan was sharing earlier, the sacrificial love of God is the center of what this meal is. Thanks be to God for his sacrificial love for us. 
May we continue in that as his people. Amen. Let's stand and sing together and the altar's open for prayer. Feel free to come down and pray. We'll sing about God's love. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son and make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away his wounds which mar the chosen one bring many ones to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me. So I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. I should I gain from Him. I know, let's sing that again. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Ethan's going to give the benediction in just a moment, but I remind you of the reception following this service in the fellowship hall for that hour. as we close. God, thank you for your love, which knows no end. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We look forward to the day, Lord, when we will see you again in heaven. And we will need not our faith, because we will have sight. And all that we will have been hoping for for so long will be realized as we meet you and have your presence. But our love, our love will remain. It will be the same love that you have grown in us since we first believed. I pray that we grow now and go now, continuing to grow in love for all of our days so that we may glorify your name. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May it go in His grace and peace. Have an amazing week, everybody. Happy Fourth.